Indigenous peoples in many parts of the world have no difficulty accepting the idea that the stones were once part of living creatures both great and small. But to us first world moderns, such ideas are the stuff of myth and fairy tale. Even so, growing numbers of independent researchers around the world are beginning to acknowledge the wisdom of these supposed primitives and engage in honest inquiry. In so doing, many, like myself, are coming to the conclusion that much of what we are taught about the physical nature of this world is inaccurate. Whether it is through the result of parenting, religion, or culture, each of us has been raised within a particular system of thought, and all too often we are oblivious to its shortcomings. I call this paradigm blindness. A paradigm is defined as a set of assumptions, concepts, values, and practices that constitute a way of viewing reality for the community that shares them, especially in an intellectual discipline. It's important to understand that nowhere in this definition does it say that a paradigm requires a basis in truth. For a paradigm to serve us as an accurate roadmap, it must be based on empirical evidence, experimentation, logic, reproducibility, scalability, and internal consistency. At their worst, flawed paradigms can exist as a form of thought virus. Free will requires discernment, but how can we properly discern if our beliefs are based on unproven assumptions? If we are unwilling to turn a critical eye on our own beliefs and humble ourselves to the possibility that we may be wrong, we become little more than non-player characters with pre-programmed responses. Four years ago, I began to question the unquestionables, and since that time I've learned more about the physical world than I had in all of the preceding years combined. It's incredibly humbling when you permit yourself to question long-held beliefs only to discover that much of what you had taken for granted as proven fact may not actually have been proven at all. I've mentioned in previous videos that the majority of those who've levied criticisms on my channel have dismissed the findings with little more than a hand wave. Because they believe that what I've presented couldn't possibly be true, they feel there's simply no need to investigate further. Only a handful of critics have taken the time to actually review the research I've presented or to pose intelligent questions. Often they raise questions that I've already addressed in the videos, and their criticisms make it glaringly obvious that they haven't even bothered to review the findings. Throughout the first five parts of this series, I presented a total of 50 specific anatomical and histological correlations between the rocky structures of the mountain Mont Go and vertebrate anatomy. Today I'll add a few new, very interesting items to that list. But first I'd like to address a couple of the criticisms that initially proved quite difficult for me to explain away. Several people in the comment threads noted that the head of the mountain, when viewed from the side, showed clear signs of sedimentary layering. In their minds, this single fact was enough to debunk the entire theory, and they felt no need to dive deeper into the remainder of the research. It was a conundrum for me. I had to admit that I couldn't explain the occurrence and I had to agree that it made no sense that a titan would petrify in layers. Still, given the very large number of anatomical coincidences that I'd already found, I wasn't ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And if we're going to be intellectually honest when attempting to apply the scientific method, we can't simply discard information that conflicts with our pet theories. It took nearly a year before it dawned on me that skull bones, specifically the parietal and temporal bones, might actually grow in this fashion. I looked for images that would demonstrate the grain of the skull bones and came across this. Right away, it occurred to me that there might indeed be a layering to the structure of the bone. It wasn't long before I found additional images that demonstrated that skull bones form like rings of a tree from the apex of the skull downward. These rings, when viewed from the side, would appear as horizontal lines. Obviously, this isn't proof that Montgo was once a titan, but it does allow for the possibility that what we call sedimentary layering could have formed instead through biological growth. 